アドバンス裁判をゲームにする不謹慎だしかも無罪を勝ち取るゲームなんて不気味面白ければ良いのではないでしょうか矛盾をついて無罪を勝ち取れ逆転裁判2 The release of the first Ace Attorney game was a massive success. With the game selling over 600,000 copies, it was about to be the start of a whole new franchise for Capcom. Though, if things were different, this franchise would have just been one game. You see, originally, the game was supposed to be a one and done for Shu Takami. However, thanks to Shinji Mikami, he managed to persuade Takami to make the games into a trilogy. And not just taking some time off and coming back for yet another stressful development cycle, we will be introduced to Gyakuten Saiben 2. Or known over here in the West as Justice for All. Objection! Justice for All released in Japan for the Game Boy Advance on October 18th, 2002, with it later coming to the States for the DS on January 16th, 2007. The game once again focuses on Phoenix Wright, a now more experienced attorney who must prove in court that his clients are innocent, all the while dealing with new challenges both professionally and personally. While the development of this game wasn't as tumultuous as the first game, it still had its own share of issues. It started with Shu Takami having only three and a half months to make the entire script for the game, something which before took him about a month to do. Just Just for a single episode. And then there were two more issues involving the story of the game and some technical stuff, respectfully. The first involved who the rival character should be, as Edward was supposed to come back because of how popular he was. In spite of that, though, the team ended up making a whole new character to serve as the rival, that new character being Manfred von Karma's daughter, Franziska. Yes, someone actually decided to, you know, um. Do the do with this bastard. And the second issue came with the amount of cases this game was supposed to have. Originally, there were supposed to be five cases in this game. Unfortunately, due to the amount of memory on the GBA cartridge, which, mind you, isn't a lot, the five cases had to be dropped down to four, resulting in the team having to completely restructure the plot of the game, something I know must have been annoying as shit to go through. Okay. If you notice where this mic is right now and just, you know, all that shit, yeah. We're doing something a little new here.、Uh, this is, this is going to be extremely scuff as fuck. I had another idea originally, but it wasn't working out the way I wanted it to be. And、uh, yeah. So、uh, prepare to experience how scuffed this shit's going to be. And I apologize in advance. Nevertheless, the game sold just as well as it did with the first game, and the recession was still largely the same. A lot of the praise went towards how well the story was written, with a lot of people loving the fact that the game was able to mix in some serious moments with comedic moments in a way in which it doesn't feel too jarring, to say the least.、And、the new gameplay additions were also praised with how well it enhanced the, let's say, Courtroom drama. However, some of the issues from the last game were still here, such as the fact that the investigations feel tedious and boring. And before, I didn't really echo the sentiment for the first game, but for Justice for All, it, it definitely feels tedious and boring. Out of all the mainline Ace Attorney games, Justice for All has been the one that I've liked the least. While there are some good things here, and a lot, in fact, I'm just now noticing, there's just as many issues with some being more annoying, at least to me. Though, considering the fact that my opinions have changed about some of the cases in the last game, uh, I am hopeful that my opinions of this game will change as a whole. Hopefully. Ugh. Just like in the last video, we will be going case by case talking about everything relating to the story, gameplay, and honestly, really just the works and stuff. But before we actually continue, there is something that we should go and talk about real quick. Beyond some slight changes in the new addition to the gameplay, it's largely the same as it was in the first game. With this in mind, though, I'm not going to go too deep into analyzing how the gameplay is beyond what I've experienced. Though, I can't spoil at least one thing about it. For how short the trials are in this game, they're pretty difficult to go through, especially when you have to go and explain your logic. Now, again, I'm not gonna go too deep into how that goes and shit, but you'll understand what I mean if you end up deciding to play through this game for yourself. Like always, I will be supplying a timestamp down in the description below for the case that you wanna go to. And with that out the way, let's go and get started, shall we? The case begins with a nightmare of the judge deeming Phoenix as someone not worthy of being an attorney. And as Phoenix wakes up from the ominous dream, confused on what it meant, he ends up getting hit over the head by the killer of this case. 
He wakes back up only to forget what his name is and what he does, and with the trial underway, he is forced to defend his client without any of his memories. Like in the first game, The Lost Turnabout is an introductory case that acts as a tutorial for the trials in this game, but it's not like how it was in the first game where for the most part, things were simple. With The Lost Turnabout, the game is treating this tutorial as more of a refresher before ramping things up. Of course, they don't draw you into the thick of things immediately, but with the two parts you have to go through in this trial, the game is slowly but steadily letting go of your hand before you continue with the game. Though before we go any further, let me quickly go over how the trials work for those who haven't watched the last video, as well as one of the new things you could do during it. To keep things brief, the main bread and butter of the trials are the cross-examination sections. These parts involve you having to expose the witness's contradictions by presenting evidence. Whenever that's not possible, you can press a statement to get more info out of them and eventually help you towards exposing said contradiction. For the most part, nothing really changed with the gameplay besides the fact that you can present someone's profile as evidence. This isn't too big of an addition, but it does provide another option for presenting evidence. Now, this isn't the only thing that this case shows you, as it also shows you the process of explaining your logic, as well as presenting evidence to support it. And with how things play out in this case, it doesn't take long to get reacquainted with things, which is great for new and returning players, as well as for me writing this script. And in the same vein of immediately showing you some of the things you'll see throughout this game, one of the other things this case does is bring out some new and familiar faces. In this case, we see the return of Maya and Gumshoe. Two characters who were still largely the same as they were in the first game. However, as the game continues on, you end up getting the sense that they ended up changing just a bit from the last game. Now, technically, we can also include the prosecutor in this case, Winston Payne. Though, if I'm going to be honest here, he's kind of a punching bag. For the next four games you'll see him in, again, he's going to be, well, washed. But this case also introduces two other characters who doesn't waste any time showing off this franchise is more eccentric characters. First is the defendant Maggie Pride. She's a police officer that is known to have the worst luck imaginable. Despite this though, she's very upbeat and is too kind for her own detriment. Finally is the killer of this case, Richard Wellington, who is on a different level compared to the killer from the first turnabout. He also likes to yap and is the most egotistical piece of shit you'll ever meet in your life. Maybe. While they aren't as crazy as some of the other characters we'll see later on, this case does do a good job at giving you just a good enough idea of how weird some of these characters can be. We already talked about Maggie and the fact that she's the unluckiest person on earth, though looking back on it for how weird Richard may seem at first, I guarantee you that at some point in life you might have encountered someone that's as arrogant or as egotistical as he is. Being a whiz, that brings me to the end of this case. Yeah, there's, there's really nothing else besides that. It's just, yeah. As the case goes on, not only do we learn that Maggie is being accused of murdering her co-worker, but Phoenix slowly begins to regain his memories of who he is and his role as an attorney. And later, with the help of Maya and some additional pieces of evidence, they're able to prove that Richard was responsible for killing Maggie's co-worker, thanks to his association with a group of con artists. However, things are falling apart when Phoenix is unable to prove how Richard could be part of this group as he wiped the contacts from his phone. That is, until Phoenix suggests for someone to call his own phone, revealing that the phone Phoenix had in the beginning of the case was actually Richard's, and after a freakout was consistent of him almost unaliving himself, Maggie ends up getting the not guilty verdict. As they're celebrating, Phoenix ends up regaining his memories of everyone close to him, and we learned that this wasn't the first time that he and Maya reunited, as something happened two months ago that brought the two back together. The case begins with a narration of what seems to be a confession, with an ending with the aftermath of a car crash. Afterwards, we see Phoenix and Maya at the detention center, where it seems like she's in the middle of yet another murder. Before we even get to that, though, this all started when Phoenix met with Dr. Gray Turner, a surgeon at a small clinic that was under controversy last year after 14 patients were accidentally killed. Initially, he wanted legal action against the nurse responsible until she died in a car accident, causing more controversy for the doctor. And in order to set things right, he enlists the help of Maya Faye to talk to the dead nurse so that he could get her to confess what she did. But the only way Maya would do this is if Phoenix is invited as well. However, the two's reunion is cut short when during the channeling, Turner is murdered, leaving Maya as the number one suspect. And for the second time, Phoenix decides to defend Maya in court, but unbeknownst to him, he is about to uncover dark secrets and has to prepare to go up against some new challenges. Despite this game being very mixed with me, Reunion and Turnabout is one out of the two cases I've really enjoyed. 
Basically because it kind of operates like Turnabout Sisters, just with some new added elements into the mix. Some of the stuff that was added here was stuff more about, you know, the lore of Maya and her family, and also introducing two new important characters. Though the big thing that this case adds is a whole new gameplay element that makes the investigations here a whole lot less monotonous. During the first day of the investigation, Maya gives Phoenix a Magatama, which is used as a way to get her younger cousin Pearl to help him, and when Phoenix presents it to her, Pearl charges it with spiritual energy and allows Phoenix to see these things known as psych locks. These locks represent the person holding back a secret, and in order to unlock it, you have to present evidence in a similar vein to cross-examinations. However, the context here is, uh slightly different. Whereas in cross-examinations, you're trying to bring out that person's lie. When you're dealing with the psych locks, you are trying to bring out the person's most darkest inner secrets. Gameplay-wise though, they're largely still the same. You end up using evidence that you gathered throughout your investigations in an attempt to try to break the locks. If you fuck up, then of course, you know, you lose health, nothing really new there. But the thing to keep in mind about psych locks is that don't expect to break them on your first go. The psych loss acts as a roadblock, which gives you the goal of finding evidence to break them. And when it's done in practice, it makes investigations feel less monotonous. I wouldn't even argue that it gives this section of the game more directed for what you need to do and where you gotta go. And it works especially for the story as the loss can be used as a way to set up for revelations, plot twists, and other big story moments. For everything it does right though, there are still some issues as a kind of a part of a larger issue within this game. The one that's the most glaring is that the investigation sections is a lot longer now. It isn't that bad in this case, but in the later ones, yeah, you're gonna be going through some hell. In a way, it's very reminiscent from the issues of Rise from the Ashes, which funny enough, now I'm thinking about it, it might have stemmed from this game and I Think Trials and Tribulations as well. Nevertheless, it is a welcome addition to this game, and it's something that's pretty important for the characters in this case. The characters in Reunion and Turnabout are mostly characters we've seen from the first game, but they do introduce five new characters, with two of them being new additions to the main cast. Starting with the returning characters is Lotta Hart, who went from being an investigative reporter to a paranormal one. If you remember how she was in the last game, then you'll be delighted to learn that this country bunkin is still the same. And this technically applies to Maya and Gumshoe as well, though there are some differences. Gumshu, while still being the lovable dork we all love, is slightly more serious with his role as a detective and is more willing to help us during the investigations, though there are moments in this case where he goes from being competent to incompetent, like when he tried on a couple of occasions to give a child a fucking gun. Don't ask me why he does this. Then there's Maya, who seems to be a slightly more mature and capable with how she uses her power, though she's still just as impulsive as she was before. As for the new characters we meet in this case, there's Inni Mini, a college student researching the occult. She's the epitome of an airhead, and for the most part, there's not really much to her character. For now, that is, wink wink. Then you have Director Hody, a patient who claims to be the director of the clinic. And there is one thing you'll immediately learn about him is that this nigga is a fucking pervert. He goes after women who are, and I quote, young, silky smooth hotties. And I would have said that he's on the same level as like Master Roshi or Jiraiya. But the more and more I think about it, the more I realize. At least those two have some fucking decorum. You see, Hody is more like a mixture between Meliodas, Mineta, and that one motherfucker from Asoku Tensei. I think he's the protagonist of there. I don't know. I haven't watched the show yet. So, yeah. Now, even though there are two other glaring characters to talk about here, I am going to save them for later on for reasons that you'll understand later. But we do have to talk about the new prosecutor in this case, Francisca Von Karma. <laughs> Francisca is the new prosecutor for this game who came all the way from Germany for one express purpose, to get her revenge on Phoenix for defeating her father. Technically there is more to this, but it doesn't really get talked about until the last case. Regardless though, Francisca is damn near a copy of her father, though what makes her a lot more of a threat is that not only is she more tenacious and will literally embarrass you by curb stomping any reason or logic you bring up, she so has a whip, which is so powerful, she managed to make the judge her bitch. Okay, let me be for real here, I'm probably exaggerating it just a bit, but let's be honest here, she, she uses that motherfucker every chance she gets. And the game doesn't waste any time showing off what she's willing to do, as she'll display her underhanded shit with no care in the world. Compared to Edgeworth, she is so much more difficult to deal with. Speaking of which, 
where is he exactly? While this case doesn't go in depth with it, all you need to know is that Edgeworth chose death. We'll learn more about that as the game continues, but before we end things here, we have two more characters that we have to talk about, who not only are integral to this case, but they also shows that there's a lot more than meets the eye here. So something to understand about Reunion and Turnabout is that for a second case, it's it's intense. It's filled with a lot of stuff from twists and turns to overall basically being a addition to the overarching plot. Said plot being heavily focused on the Faye family after the departure of Maya's mother, Misty Faye. The first game took time to show the reason why Misty left, but this game adds onto it by covering how the Kurain village works and who can lead it. In this case, it would eventually be Maya since her mother was the previous leader before she essentially went, well, MIA. And because of this possibility, it ends up turning this whole entire case into a major conspiracy to ensure that Maya doesn't become the new leader of the Korean village. Also, that one little girl would end up taking her place, that being the new character, Pearl Fay. She's Maya's younger cousin and is something of a prodigy when it comes to her spiritual energy. And because of this, you have Maya's aunt, Morgan Fay, concocting the plan to put her own daughter in the position of the village's leader over Maya. All because she couldn't be the leader because her powers were weak compared to her sister, Misty. It's a lot, I know, but let's be real here, she's very dedicated to making this happen. Her plan involves getting the help of Innie, the Disney College student I mentioned earlier, who so happens to want to get revenge on Grey Turner for the death of her sister. And with her help, the plan was to 1. Have any disguise as Maya and hide during the channeling ceremony, 2. Knock Maya out and hide her somewhere within the chambers, and 3. Kill Great Turner and make it seem like Maya was the one who did it. And if things were different, Morgan might have gotten away with it, if Phoenix didn't get the help from Maya. Towards the end of the second day of the investigation, Phoenix uncovers the plot I mentioned earlier. Alongside this, he learns from Mia that if you were to channel someone, you wouldn't be able to have dreams, something that ends up completely changing the case alongside a few pieces of evidence. On the final day of the trial, Phoenix at first struggles to make his case to prove that Amy was the one that killed the victim. It isn't until after the recess that Phoenix exposes a major twist. Eni is actually Mimi. And no matter how many times I write that, it still feels weird to say, but it, anyway. Phoenix exposes to the court that Mimi was the one who actually survived the car crash, though the reason why her face looks like her younger sister is because Mimi's face was so burned she had to get it reconstructed using Eni's ID as a base. Despite Francisca crying that it is impossible, Mimi confesses this to be true, and after a big blow up from Francisca, Maya is declared innocent. Out of the verdict, Maya is finally able to reunite with Mia. The reunion is touching, but it doesn't last long when Maya ponders why her aunt would do such a thing, with Phoenix setting into reality that her aunt wanted no one but Pearl to be the leader. We later cut to Morgan, who acknowledges her failed plan, and in the most foreshadowing way imaginable, she manifests that her daughter's time will come to be the leader soon. Reunion and Turnabout, again, is one of my favorite cases in this game. Even before connecting the dots of the overarching story, this was a great great case to introduce some of the new elements here. The Sight Lux in particular is easily one of my favorite gameplay additions to the series. Before, I used to love it for how it made investigations less boring and gave you some direction on where to go and what to do. And for the most part, those still apply, but now I love it for the more thematic aspect or the story aspect. I'm not too sure whichever or makes sense. As you'll see later on, this game is built around secrets that a lot of people hold back, and in turn becomes the reason why a murder occurs. It's done best in both this case and the last of how uncovering them leads to some shocking revelations. Other than that, there's some other stuff I like here as well. Pearl is an adorable addition to the cast, especially for this game, which is gonna start getting a little darker in tone. Though, spoiler alert, she isn't with us much in the next case. The new prosecutor, Francisca, is another cool new addition. Though, to be honest with you, I used to hate her character with a burning passion, but as we continue on, you'll see that opinion change a lot. And finally is the overarching plot. Unfortunately, this is the last case to add on to it. Plus, I can barely talk about what this case sets up for in the next game as it will 100% without doubt spoil trials and tribulations. Fuck! And now it's time to get on to the next case. Ha <laughs> ha Oh, fuck me. I'm not looking forward to this at all. Hmm. Six months have passed since the events of Reunion and Turnabout, and since then, Phoenix and Maya have been trying to do things with Pearl to cheer her up, and it so happens that they head to the circus where they experience a spectacular performance from Maximilian Galactica. Weird name, I know, let's just, let's just not worry about it, let's just, let's just keep it pushing, you know? Push it. 
Push it real good, like salt and pepper, you know? <laughs> Two days afterwards, though, Phoenix and Maya are contacted to help defend Max, who was being tried for murder. After a bit of convincing and practically instantly fearing to our potential client, he accepts, and Phoenix and Maya begin their investigation on a rather odd murder. Now, let me keep it a buck with you. I do not like Turnabout Big Top. Even though in essence, Big Top is very similar to Turnabout Samurai in a way in which we have weird ass characters and a weird circumstances that is the murder, the thing about Big Top is that it doesn't have a lot of the charm that Turnabout Samurai has. The best way I can describe this case is that it brings out one of the big issues with this game. The last case sort of displayed it, but Turnabout Big Top puts the bitch on a bright ass billboard for the whole world to see. Now the issue mainly involves the pacing of the game. It was something that I didn't really talk about in the last video, or if I did it was only a little, but nonetheless it is something that can make a case either feel like a joy to go through, or an absolute slog. Funny enough, this was one of the main issues from Rise of the Ashes. It's just like in that case, you'll be spending most of your time in the investigation phase. And it would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that you have to exhaust every option in order to move on. Plus with the Cyclops, you'll be also spending some time trying to find evidence to break them as that roadblock feeling that I mentioned before can cause this case to come to a screeching halt. It's at its worst during the first part of the investigation when you're trying to figure out what evidence to find and if you had enough to even be able to break the locks. Then you end up spending damn near 30 minutes moving from place to place trying to find some crumb of evidence only to realize that you either didn't do something earlier or you didn't talk to this one person. Ah! It's something I realized when like going through some of the footage of this game. Uh, This case is just as long as the last one. But you wouldn't tell because this case right here feels long as shit. Here's the thing, both cases took me over three hours and four minutes to do with this current case being slightly ahead by four seconds. Despite it almost being the same length, it felt like reunion and turnabout was a lot shorter. And maybe it has to do with one of the other issues in this case, the characters. Now. If you thought this game hadn't introduced any weird ass characters yet, Turnabout Big Top is here to change it, especially since a lot of the weird ass characters here are pretty much a part of the circuit, so it makes sense. The first character we meet is her defendant Maximilian Galactica, or Max for short, cause I ain't saying all that shit. He is a famous magician being framed for the murder of this case's victim, Russell Berry, the ringleader of the circus. And one thing you'll come to learn throughout this case is that everybody hates Max, and it's justified too, cause this dude is an arrogant asshole and has an ego that could rival the killer from the lost turnabout. Though once you break him down, he's just a country boy wanting to make it big and shit. Next is Mo, who's a clown that likes to make a whole bunch of bad jokes. In spite of that, he's the second most grounded person in this entire cast next to one other we'll mention last. Next we have Benjamin Woodman, a shy ventriloquist who doesn't really speak much until he equips his puppet, Trillo, who is basically Ben if he was a little bit more outspoken. And honestly, there was many times in this case where I wanted to punt that little bastard to the stratosphere. Then we have Regina Berry, the daughter of Russell Berry and an animal trainer. Now, I'm not gonna be as harsh with this character because she's lived in the circus all her life. And because of that, she's very naive about, well, life, something that irritates our final character, Acro. Acro was a former acrobat before a tragedy occurred that confined him to a wheelchair. Now, all the characters I just mentioned are all connected in the sense that they're like one big dysfunctional family. They're all working together to try to keep the circus going while constantly bumping heads with one another. For the most part, it's usually Max bumping heads with people because of how much of an asshole he is. But the exception to the rule is Regina. And that kind of brings us to the, uh, oh, Boy, I, I really don't want to talk about this shit. Early on in this case, you learn that everybody loves Regina, with Max and Ben, or technically Trillo, who is the most infatuated with her, even to the point of fighting one another. Now look, this will be all fine and dandy if it wasn't for the fact that Regina is 16, Max is 21, and Trillo slash Ben, 31. As much as I would love to go on a tangent about why the fuck is this in here, just know that in the anime, they've removed the love triangle. Yeah. Ugh. Beyond that though, I don't really care too much about these guys. Mo is a slight exception, though not by much. This does change during the second day of the investigation because not only do we learn of a great tragedy, which turns the case from meh to pretty good, we also learn the fate of a particular character we haven't seen yet, Miles Edgeworth. In the last case, whenever Edgeworth is brought up, Phoenix will usually have a visual reaction to hearing his name. And once we get to the second part of the investigation and get confronted by Francisca, we end up learning that Edgeworth chose 
death. Now, if we're just playing the GBA portion of this game, uh, this will end up coming out of left field, like something shocking that once you dig about it a bit, it doesn't really make that much sense. But with the knowledge of the stuff that goes down during Rising the Ashes, it actually makes Edgeworth's decision make a lot more sense. But we don't learn his explicit reason for doing this until the last case. You can imagine it has to do with his worth as an attorney. Regardless though, his motivation for leaving starts to make a whole lot more sense considering that he was the other reason why Francisca came to America. While the confrontation is short, it brings with it a lot of tension between Phoenix and Francisca when it comes to how they go about being in attorney. Now, while all of this and more doesn't get talked about until the next case, it serves as a foreshadowing for some things that do get revealed. I also wanted to make a quick side tangent specifically about Francisca, but I'm going to save that for later because I want to wrap up this circus act. I'm not making this video any longer than it will possibly be. During the second day of the investigation, Phoenix and Maya discover a threatening note calling for the murderer to meet them at the lodging house plaza. It's later discovered that the note was meant for Regina Barry, and after some further investigation, Phoenix and Maya ends up learning about a tragedy that occurred at the circus. We learn from Mo about Akro's little brother, Bat, who six months ago fell into a coma after a lion bit down on his head. It stands for Bat and Regina's playful friendship, where they often try to prank each other, and on the day of the tragedy, Bat urged Regina to let him perform with Leon, the circus lion. As Bat put his head inside Leon's mouth, the lion had an expression that looked like he was smiling, and before long the lion bit down on Bat's head, with Akira attempting to free his brother only to get injured and bound to a wheelchair in the process. Phoenix goes to Akira who confirms Moses' story, and even attempts to give Phoenix a scarf that belonged to his brother. That is, until Francisca shows up, takes the scarf, and wheels Akro off, who is the main witness for tomorrow's trial. During said trial, Phoenix is slowly able to prove that Akro is the killer by explaining the theory that he killed the victim by using a statue that Max won from a competition to drop it on the victim's head. That's at least the long and short of it, because believe me, the explanation is a long one. Just as the case is about to end, Akro congratulates Bright on his theory for being convincing, but he adds on one little ding. Where's the murder weapon? Danks end up looking grim at first until Maya comes through with a save and asks the judge for more time to figure out where the weapon could be. And after some thinking, Phoenix realizes that the murder weapon was in this very courtroom, specifically under Akro's wheelchair. Akro confirms this to be true as well as explaining that a surprise raid by the police caused him to have to quickly hide it. And after admitting the truth, Max gets the not guilty verdict. Though what was supposed to be a happy moment turns into a sad one when Regina realizes what she had done, but it quickly turns into a positive one when Mel decides to become the new ringleader of the circus, with Max and Regina on board to make it the best circus ever. But it doesn't end there. We cut to a scene of Gumshoe on the phone with a mysterious person, which is eventually revealed to be Miles Edgeworth. Yeah, this next case is about to get crazy. So, um, I could go on and say that Turnabout Big Top is one of the worst cases ever. And don't get me wrong, this case has a lot of issues, a lot of issues, a lot of which I do not like. But after thinking about it, especially with this playthrough and my last, it's not as bad or I don't hate it as much as I used to. But the main reason why I don't is because of the second half of this case, which is basically its redeeming factor. Apart from the fact that the investigation in this part is a lot faster, the main reason why I love it is because of Acro. Similar to DVAC Quest, whose name I was actually saying right before, a tragic event shaped them into who they are now, and I like to think that Acro is essentially VAC Quest if he really had a motive against Hammer. You see, Acro's whole reason for doing the things he did was to kill Regina, who he thought was so irredeemable, despite the fact that she's just extremely naive about things, especially when it comes to stuff surrounding life. And it could have made it where Acro was a stubborn dude who doesn't accept the reality of his brother's accident, but the game instead makes it so that after the murder had happened, he realizes his desire to kill Regina came from a place of grief. It also helps that he's more of a tragic character and someone you feel bad for despite the things he did. Other than that, I still don't necessarily like this case but it's not to the point where I would do anything to outright avoid it. Now we're reaching the end game and thank God this game only has four cases, thank God. But now it's time to talk about the final case of the game and the one that I struggle just a little bit to write about, Farewell My Turnabout. 
The case starts with an announcement for who will win the Hero of Heroes, with the winner being a character known as the Nickel Samurai, and afterwards we cut to Phoenix and the others who have been invited to the event by Will Powers, our defendant in the last game. However, Danes go sideways as during the time a special announcement was to be made by the Nickel Samurai, the actor who played the Jamming Ninja is found dead in his room, and Danes get even worse when Maya ends up being kidnapped by an assassin named Shelly the Killer, and the only way to save her is to win the acquittal of her new client, Matt Ungard. While this final case is isn't as grand as Turnabout Goodbyes or Rise from the Ashes, it's easily one out of the two cases in this trilogy that will have you feeling tense as hell, from the situation surrounding Maya to one of the big mysteries surrounding this case. This also includes the drama here, which is easily on par with those daytime soap operas that your grandma likes to watch. And with the amount of shit to talk about, including the development of Francisca and Phoenix, yeah, this whole entire section, if I were to talk about everything, would probably be about 20 to 30 minutes long. And mind you, that's not even including the gameplay, which one thing to keep in mind is that all the investigations in this case are all split between two parts. Yeah, it's a... Uh... It's gonna be a long one. Now, if we had to start somewhere in this sea of shit to talk about, let's actually talk about the elephant in the room here, the return of Miles Edgeworth. Don't worry, it's gonna make sense soon enough. As mentioned in the last case, Edgeworth is revealed to still be alive. Though his return is kind of mixed. Gumshoe was of course happy as hell to see him come back. On the other hand though, Francisca and especially Phoenix are pissed about this. But the reason why he left does make a lot of sense and ends up being sort of the theme going forward during this case. Follow me for just a sec. For those who need a refresher about Rise of the Ashes real quick, after the events of that case, Ezra really had to ponder what it meant to be an attorney. And mind you, he was being mentored by someone who basically just did dirty tricks and it's still into Ezra that winning is everything. And when something like that becomes the basis for how you kind of operate and go about life and that shit gets broken, it, it's gonna fuck with you heavily. And so we fast forward to now where Edgeworth is back and he, he's a little different now. He's mostly the same as he was in the first game, but now he is a lot more confident and less brooding. And the reason why his return is so important is because of one of the major themes that surrounds this case. Beyond the overall conflict, this case is one that acts as what it means to be an attorney, with Francisca and Phoenix front and center. We already have an idea about Francisca, but for Phoenix, he's a little different. We know Phoenix became an attorney not only because of Edgeworth, but to also help those in need. Alongside that, he learned from Mia to always trust his clients, but this case challenges all of that, and while I want to save the big twist for later, uh, it's something that causes him to go through something similar to what Edgeworth went through, just not as dramatic, kind of. And this is the most some of the hard truths that this case goes through, especially for the mystery of it all. Now, we're no strangers to the, some of the, you know, mysteries in Ace Attorney, but one of the major things about the mystery in this case is that it far exceeds any of the ones that we've seen throughout this game and the last game especially. So before we can actually talk about the mystery in this case, we need to talk about some of the characters involved because these motherfuckers, oh my god. First we have our client Matt Ungard, who is something of an airhead and largely dependent on his manager. Speaking of which, we have Adrian Andrews, Matt's manager who is strong will yet cold and smug. And finally is the victim in this case, Juan Corrida, or Corrida, or Corrida, I, I'm not sure, I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce that. But there's one more character that's important here, Celeste Impact, so we'll talk about more about her in a couple seconds or so. At first, things start simple with the fact that there's an intense rivalry between Matt and Juan. For what reason, you may ask? I don't know, fucking dick measuring contest? Honestly, the game doesn't even go into detail why these guys are beefing in the first place. However, after our reunion with Edgeworth, it starts this noble effect of learning some of the most horrible shit surrounding these four. Now, I'm gonna make this a very long story told short because this whole thing, there's so many more layers to this shit, but regardless, it starts with the death of Celeste, who ended her own life because of a scandalous tabloid. And her death affected Adrian, who was not only her mentor, but someone who she was emotionally dependent on, and it affected her so much in fact that Adrian tried to, uh, it's, uh, let's just say, unalive yourself. It's, yeah. Fortunately, it didn't happen, but it did lead to her wanting to take revenge on the one she deemed responsible, Matt Ungard. Despite this not becoming the basis for the investigation until after the first day of the trial, as you're going through it, you're under this belief that Matt had nothing to do with both Celeste's death 
or the murder. Especially since early on we ended up asking Matt whether or not he killed Juan or not, Matt ended up saying no, causing no Cyclops to appear. But that's when shit starts to get a little crazy. Because during the last part of the investigation, more and more evidence is found that's connected to our client, alongside him suddenly appearing with psych locks. And when we go to break them, it only takes one lock to discover the horrifying truth. The one responsible for having Maya be kidnapped, the death of Juan, and everything surrounding Celeste was because of Matt Ungard. This motherfucker is the big plot twist of this case. And I know that the way I led up to it may not have been, you know, anything special or anything, but you need to understand that when you come across this twist, it blindsides you like a freaking freight train. Up to this point, we've been defending Matt and treating him as if he was innocent, but the second day of the investigation leads to his reveal of being the mastermind. He was the one who hired Shelly the killer to both kill Juan and to kidnap Maya as insurance so that we'll have no choice but to defend him. But, but wait, wait, there's more. more. Matt also had a hand in the death of Celeste after basically ruining her and Juan's engagement by basically telling Juan he tapped that first. You what? Yep, he is the epitome of a piece of shit. And you wanna know what's really fucked up about all of this? We have to get that not guilty verdict for his ass in order to save Maya. Yeah, talk about some bullshit. And before you guys go like, oh, I feel so bad for Juan, man. That man got done dirty. <laughs> That motherfucker ain't safe either. These two's rivalry quite literally caused the death of an innocent woman. And at that point, they should have just got together and But this reveal is actually bringing something back to us. Cause something that I ended up mentioning a little earlier was about Phoenix and his motivations as an attorney. Up until recently, Phoenix has had clients that were genuinely innocent. Sure, some of them were weird and or assholes, but it wasn't as bad as what he's dealing with now. And with him having to defend someone that's responsible for all this heinous shit, Phoenix ponders how the hell he could defend someone who's basically a monster. Even with a message from Maya, who basically gives us the A-OK -okay to try to find Matt Ungard guilty, the circumstances surrounding this is still extremely like tense and scary. So what ends up happening on the final day of the trial is both intense, but satisfying. Before the final day of the trial, Phoenix ends up having the same nightmare that he had from the first case, feeling even more relevant now than ever. And later on, as Phoenix is preparing for the trial, he gets a call from Gumshoe telling him to prolong the trial so that he and the police will have enough time to find Maya. However, as the trial began and subsequently continued, Phoenix and Ezra struggles to keep the trial going with Shelly the killer on the stand. And with each testimony they go through, it always seems that like they take one step forward and a hundred steps back. And during the last recess for the trial, the only thing they can rely on is some evidence that Gumshoe found at Shelly's hideout, and he gets into a fucking car accident. God damn it! Court reconvenes for the last time, and despite Phoenix and Ezra doing all they can to hold out and prove that Unguard was the assassin's client, the judge decides to call for a verdict, and before Phoenix can make a decision, Franziska pops into the courtroom with the evidence Gumshoe has in tow. Phoenix ends up getting the chance to present this new evidence, however, the judge rejects it, thinking that it doesn't solve who the killer's client is. Despite this, Phoenix brings up the videotape to the killer and uses it to expose the fact that Unguard had recorded the killing and was planning to blackmail the assassin. Pissed at what he discovered, the killer releases Maya and vows to find Unguard and get his revenge. With Maya safe and Ezra further instilling fear onto Unguard about how capable the killer is, we get the sweet, sweet satisfaction of saying, My client, the Honorable Matt Ongon, should go right to fucking jail! Despite this being Phoenix's first loss, he and the others celebrate the return of Maya, yet the reunion ends abruptly thanks to Franziska, who ends up crashing out when her ideals are shattered. Regardless, the group celebrates with Phoenix rekindling his friendship with Ezworth, though this isn't exactly where things end. After the credits, we see Ezworth confronting Francisca before she leaves, and through their conversation, we learn that Francisca's motivation as an attorney was to live up to her father's name and make him proud. And after some encouragement from Ezworth, Francisca breaks down and promises to never be in Ezworth's shadow ever again, and finally to face Phoenix once again in the future. Jesus Christ, this case is long and sad as shit, it's just, oh man. This case is in the top 10 of one of my favorite cases in this entire franchise. I would even say that I like it just as much as Turnabout Goodbye, though it's 
probably a slightly more. Regardless though, both cases have this level of insanity that makes you feel anxious as you're going through investigations and finding out different revelations. Though in my opinion, what makes Fear All My Turnabout slightly better than Turnabout Goodbyes is just how much you end up caring about the secondary characters. Now, I'm mainly talking about Adrian, Matt, Juan, and Celeste, especially with their connection to this case's overall mystery. Because as we're trying to figure out, you know, what happened to Celeste and what led up to her death, it ends up turning this case from like one that's really tense into something that's very, very, okay, I was trying to find the word, another word for it, but there's no other way to describe it. It's extremely freaking tragic. Originally, I was going to bring up a parallel I saw between Phoenix and Edgeworth and Adrian and Celeste in the context of Phoenix's reaction to Edgeworth's supposed death, but I have seen somewhere that they're more related to the rivalry between Juan and Matt. And for the most part, it really makes sense, especially in the sense that Phoenix and Edgeworth's rivalry could have gotten a whole lot worse if it wasn't for the fact that these two are practically lovers. Like, I see it. I'm pretty sure you, the viewer, sees it. Let's just call a spade a spade here. But one of the main characters who are pretty much sidelined for a good majority of this case is Francisca, and especially with her motivations as an attorney and everything surrounding it, because it's it's a lot. While Francisca isn't the main prosecutor for this case after being shot by Shelley the killer, her story in this case is something I've come to really enjoy and relate to now more than ever. So for a little bit of context here, prior to my last two playthroughs, I used to hate Francisca, especially because of how obnoxious she was. And this is saying something, especially in the franchise, that does have some characters that are a little bit more obnoxious than others. But the more and more I realized, you know, I really took the time to understand Francisca as a character, the more I realized that, of course, she's going to be obnoxious. She's 18. When you're that age, of course, you're going to be an obnoxious little shit. I know I was at one point, but it also really made me take a step back. And while trying to understand Francisca as a character, as an attorney, rival, all of that shit, I've come to really like relate to her story and also her struggles as of course an attorney. Francisca is a character who is bound by legacy because she's the daughter of Manfred von Karma whose whole motto is to be essentially perfect and always win her cases no matter what. She has this expectation to uphold that's basically unattainable and it's something that really affects Francisca who's essentially been under the shadow of Edgeworth ever since he ended up coming to her life. And with everything that she tried to do to prove to her father that she's just as good as Edgeworth by the time we get to this case, it's practically null and void. The whole time throughout this case, at least through the early parts of this case, Seal's basically being the crash out, basically saying, oh, you wanna do this? All right, fuck you, bitch, or do fuck you too, or then, you know, firing gumshoe, doing all of these things because she's realizing, or at least get to the point of realizing that everything that she's been doing and working towards throughout her whole entire life, practically, has basically just been null and void. It doesn't freaking matter anymore. and. In that sense, it's extremely sad and extremely relatable, at least to me and stuff, because I felt like I've always had to try to prove to people that I'm not this or I am this and so on and so forth. And that type of shit can fuck with you very, very much. And in that sense, I relate to her. Now, I know that was a little long with it and I do apologize, but I couldn't have said it any other way. While she isn't being out some of the other characters I love in this franchise, she is someone who basically just won a seat of being on the top 10 of my favorite characters. My feelings on Justice For All is, let's say very weird. When I was younger, this was a game that I dreaded going back to, from its issues to really just me not caring too much about the story that's presented. Though after my last two playthroughs of this game, I ended up enjoying Justice For All a little bit more. The game still has its issues, mainly in the pacing department, and there's also the fact that I don't really care that much for at least two of the cases in this game. And I'm gonna spoil this real quick, but once we get to Trials and Tribulations, just know that there are two cases I do not give a fuck about. There's one that's slightly better, that's technically the second case in the game, and the third case, uh, I really do not give a fuck about. You'll understand why once we get there. Regardless though, after having played Justice For All again for this video and understanding what this game does right, my overall opinion has changed from being negative to actually somewhat positive. So, should you play Justice For All? Yes, though before we actually, you know, end this video, there is a couple things I wanna kinda bring 
up at this point since it seems like a good time now than ever to do so. In the context of how you should go about playing the Ace Attorney games, everyone is going to tell you to play by order of release, which yes, is true. This somewhat applies to the spinoff games too, but it's more in a sense that you'll be playing them back to back and you can play them pretty much after you play one trilogy or the other trilogy or just all that shit. And even though you can't play one game without having played another, you're more than likely going to be lost when it comes to the story, because each game builds on both the gameplay and story from one another. So let's say, for example, you decided to skip the first Ace Attorney game so that you could go and play Justice for All. Gameplay-wise, the game does a good job introducing the mechanics to you. Story-wise, though, you're not going to understand shit that's going on. And it's important to play the original trilogy in order, because once we get to Trials and Tribulations, which is really just the next video, that basically becomes the conclusion for everything that the first game and this game sets up and or introduces. And mind you, this also applies towards the next trilogy as well. Though, if you really don't care about the overarching plot of these games, you really just want to play them because you've heard good things about it, then you don't really have to play them in order, but I at least would recommend to play them in order so of course things can make sense. Especially gameplay-wise, because once we get to the next trilogy, they start doing some new shit, so yeah. And with that, thank you guys so so much for watching till the end of the video. Well, I made you guys wait another month for this video. Uh, and you know, it actually wasn't the whole, you know, content this time, you know, that part taking too long. The script actually didn't take that long to do this time. Uh, it was more IRL shit. Things are getting hectic over here, so yeah. <laughs> Regardless though, I'm already getting started on the next video, Trials and Tribulations, the final game in this trilogy and the one that I'm Oh, I'm really excited to go over. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. Hit the little bell notification so you guys know when the next video is going to be coming out. Uh, Twitch-wise, I will also be, you know, putting my Twitch channel on the link down in the description below. Though, uh, don't expect a stream for the next couple weeks because, one, uh, my internet has been on the fritz a little bit, so it's been a little, little wonky. And the second thing, i got to fix my PC a bit because it randomly keeps on crashing during streams and I don't know why it happened. It only happened two times, but that shit is just enough for me to, you know, to, ah! <laughs> and make sure to stay safe, stay hydrated, go outside and touch some grass and experience the great wonders of our world. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.